Why did my Savior come to earth? That's a question we ask over and over again. Sometimes we ask it just simply because as Christians, we, we want to know why he did what he did. Others ask it because we're talking about the Son of God here. I mean, you ask the Son of God to come do something, and he's going to look at you probably like, what? What are you asking me for? Go do, do it yourself. Well, we can't do this ourselves, can we? That's part of the question, part of the problem. So this morning I want to take just a few minutes, and when a preacher says that, you know he's lying, right? Okay. Take just a few minutes and go through this process of answering a couple of questions about why did Jesus come to earth, and then from that to derive the understanding of what that means to us. So let's go through this story for a moment. Zacchaeus uh, very well expressed the idea that the Lord comes to you and says, I'm going to your house. You better get over there and get ready for me right quick. But even more important to that, I think, is the fact that he called him by name. Did you notice that? Who introduced him? Nobody, as far as we can tell. But he called him by name. How about the story of Nathaniel? Now, he doesn't call Nathaniel by name, but he says, Before I saw you under the fig tree, I knew you. And Nathaniel says, Well, how, how do you know me? How do you know me? We're talking about the Son of God here, aren't we? We're not talking about the average human being, the average person on earth. We're talking about the Son of God. So this Jesus comes up and he sees Zacchaeus in the tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come on, I'm going to go home with you. Now Zacchaeus, uh, the name Zacchaeus is, uh, well actually, we know it's a, it's a Jewish name. And uh, the ending on it doesn't mean so much as the beginning part of it. We know we have Zach Zachariah, for example, is one of the Old Testament prophets. That would have had the same root name. There would have been others that would have been named that at that time as well. But he was a chief tax collector. Head tax collector, I guess you'd call it. He had tax collectors underneath him. So what you have here is someone who had established himself as being good enough for them to place other tax collectors underneath him. Now, to some way of thinking among the Jews, for example, that would have meant he was not just a sinner, but one of the big sinners, one of the head sinners, one of the chief sinners. Does that make sense? Here's someone who actually was so looked down upon by the Jewish people that when he did say, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your home, the first thing that the people around Jesus did was grumble. What in the world is he doing going to the home of a sinner? And then he says something very interesting because Zacchaeus tells Jesus at this home, at this dinner, that he gives half away, that he's going to give half away, or he does give half of his possessions to the poor. And if he's defrauded anybody, he's going to give back a lot more. We sometimes forget that that's actually what it says you should do in the law of Moses. But basically what he said is, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm doing it. And I will continue to do it. I will contend to you to be righteous before God. Now, we're talking about a rich man here, aren't we? Did Jesus come to save the rich? Why did my Savior come to earth? I come to save all the rich people. Do they need saving? Absolutely. In fact, how many of you know a rich person who's not saved, who needs salvation badly? All of us do, don't we? Do you know some poor people too? Oh, yeah, we, we know that too. Okay. Yeah, but who is it we think of as being somebody significant? Not the poor folk. There's lots of them, right? But the rich folks. He was rich. Was he iniquitous because he was rich? In the mind of the culture, there would have been a tendency to think that way. But that may not have been what it was all about because the tax collector was actually a position of the Romans. That was filled by the local citizen of the people that he was collecting taxes from. So we had a Jew who was serving the Romans in opposition to the Jews in his land. He was gathering taxes for the Romans, in other words, from the Jews. And if we look at this, we have to think about it for a minute. How did he get his job? Oh, he went through this interview process. He got his name on one of the internet web job sites, and they said, you're the man for our, for our job. Went through the interview process. No, what he did is he brought a whole load of money to him and says, I got more where that comes from if you make me tax collector. Now, that maybe is oversimplified, but that's basically what it was. Essentially, every term, every year, he had to bring the money that the Romans expected from his region 
and give it to the Romans. Now, if he got any living out of it, he had to collect more than what the Romans were extracting. That's kind of oversimplified, but that's, that's basically what we understand happened. And the presumption that they were doing it dishonestly, the idea that he was defrauding the people was a presumed guilt. By the way, we live in a country in which uh, it says on paper in our laws that we're innocent until proven guilty, correct? All countries of the world follow that same pattern, don't they? No? I'm mistaken? In fact, we had just released this week an individual, a uh, military reservist, who had been kept for over 200 days in Mexico because of a presumed guilt. Napoleonic law says that you're guilty until proven innocent. Well, that's kind of cute. How does it that one proves innocence again? It's kind of tough, isn't it? See, we have a much more logical system, so we must have a better system, right? Yeah, we've never kept anybody wrongfully before, have we? There was a lady that was just released from prison, 17 years was it she spent in prison, wrongfully convicted of a murder that she didn't commit. Okay, that happens. We don't want it to happen. We hope it doesn't happen. By the way, how many of us in here, if God punishes us, it'll be a mistake on God's part because we don't deserve it? Anybody in here? You see, that's not the point, is it? However, in the case of Zacchaeus, here's an individual that the presumption of guilt probably fit. Now, that maybe is our perception 2,000 years later. I don't know. Maybe he wasn't unrighteous, but guess what? Scripture says all are unrighteous. The Scripture says all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Is there a presumption on our part that is valid that Zacchaeus was a sinner that needed to be saved? Yes. Was it because he was a tax collector? Probably not. It probably had to do more with the fact that he was a man, a person. And we are sinners. It's interesting to see the unfolding of the gospel theology in Romans. He talks about the salvation by faith after he's talked about the pagans or the Gentiles, the idolaters, are sinners. Then in chapter 2, the Jews are sinners. They're supposed to be the righteous people. Yeah, but they're sinners too. And then in chapter 3, just to make sure we don't miss the point, he says, all are sinners. And then he goes on to talk about that salvation. But as he goes through it, we find this unfolding of this idea that God had to come to earth to save man. Romans chapter 5, for example, he talks about through one man sin into the world, and through sin death came to all men. But notice this conclusion, because all men are sinners. And then he shows how that through one man life came to this world, through one man life came to all, not because of what we did, but because of what God did. In Romans chapter 5, for example, starting about verse 6, going through verse 8, he expresses the idea that we might die for somebody who's really good. Somebody who is really extraordinary, we might lay down our lives in their place. But generally the attitude is, no, probably not. But God did that. He showed his own love, demonstrated his own love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did Jesus come to earth? Oh, I've got a good one. We're coming up on the Christmas season here in another month or so. Actually, that started last month in the stores, didn't it? Never mind. The idea of Christmas season is that uh, we have the Christ child born, right? The prophecy in Isaiah says that he will what? He'll be in peace and goodwill towards all men. I like that. It's great in this world where peace is kind of hard to come by, isn't it? Starting in Isaiah chapter 9, let's go to verse 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. What's that last one? Prince of Peace. So that's why Jesus came, wasn't it? To bring peace. We're not going to have wars anymore. We're not going to have uh, ISIS invading Iraq and Syria and the rest of the world when they get a chance. We're not going to have a uh, plane shot out of the air over Ukraine because they're in the wrong airspace. We're not going to be having these kinds of wars and rumors of wars because Jesus came to bring peace, didn't he? Eh, I don't know about that. Matthew 10, verse 34. Jesus, in talking to the people, said very plainly, 
Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth, but rather I have come to bring a sword. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And then he talks about a person who comes to him must be willing to hate his father, mother, sister, brother, whomever, more than him, because they are not acceptable to him. It cannot be his disciple unless they do. I came to bring a sword. I don't think peace is why Jesus came to the earth, do you? It doesn't appear that way in Scripture anyway. How about he came to give hope? Yeah, well, hope is a big part of the gospel message, isn't it? How about Matthew 12, verse 21? And in his name shall the Gentiles hope. Now, this is specifically talking about the non-righteous people, the non-covenant people of God, the people like you and me who are not Israelites, who had no hope and had no promise prior to the coming of the Christ. But the hope that he brought was in the gospel hope, not in the just generally hope. It was in the hope that God sent him here with as the Son of God, as the sacrifice of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 2, the, Through whom also we have had our access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So I can say he brought hope, and that's why he came to earth, but that doesn't quite get the answer, does it? The hope is a result of what he came to do, not in and of itself the end that all that he really came for. How about comfort? You know, I like the idea that Jesus came to uh, comfort us, but there's something about that that again doesn't quite get to the, the real issue, does it? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5, As the sufferings of Christ abound unto us, even so our comfort also abounds through Christ. Comfort is a big part of the gospel. But it's not in and of itself comfort. Oh, I feel so badly for you. Please comfort yourself in my name. It's comfort in what? In the sacrifice Jesus made for us. And we're going to see that in just a moment. One more. Did Jesus come to heal the sick? I hear some people today saying, yeah, that's what, what Jesus came for. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the laying on of hands. That's why we have healings today, etc., etc. Now, whether you believe there are healings today or not is not really the point. The question is, is that why Jesus came to earth, to heal the physical body? And again, we have to go back to the scripture on the subject and say, wait a minute. He did a lot of healing while he was here. He gave the gifts of healings to his disciples, and it appears that during the early church they used them freely. But that doesn't seem to be the point. The point was not so much the healing as it was the preaching of the gospel. And we're going to get to that next then. Why did Jesus come to earth? Now, the song that we sang says, Why did my Savior come to earth? Because he loved me so much. That seems to be a reasonable expectation then as we discuss this question. In John chapter 3, verse 16, the passage that almost everybody quotes at one time or another in their lives God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is that love factor. And uh, recently we've had some people talking about love suggesting that we can't really understand that depth of love because we're human. We can acknowledge it intellectually. We can feel it internally as a thank God He loved me that much and a wonderful response to that love in our faith. But the actual understanding of it would require that we have an infinite nature ourselves to be able to understand the nature of infinite love. Perhaps that's true. But the idea of healing the sick and saving the lost, here's Zacchaeus in a tree. He comes down, Jesus calls him by name, he goes to his home. Boy, there's a proof that Jesus could not be the Son of God, could not be the Messiah, could not be the Son of David, could not be our Redeemer. Why? Because he's doing something wrong by going to have dinner at that sinner's house. That's an attitude we carry with us in a culture that's pretty much universal. It wasn't just the Jews that had that attitude. We have it today as well. This has got to be proof that so-and-so is not righteous, is not living the way he should. But Jesus came to save Zacchaeus, didn't he? Jesus came to save him. Now, one of the arguments he makes here, after he gets through with the statement concerning, I'll give back if I have defrauded anyone, is this day salvation has come to your house. Because, now here's an interesting point, he's a son of Abraham also. Now, I don't know about you, that would seem out of place if I read it anywhere else. 
But reading it in the context of Zacchaeus' home makes sense. If he said it in Haskell's home, it wouldn't make sense. I am a son of Abraham, but not in the way that he's speaking of Zacchaeus at that point. Zacchaeus was a law keeper. He was an Israelite under the covenant relationship that God had with Israel. As the son of Abraham, he would have been under that covenant relationship and would have been responsible to God accordingly. And it appears that he's expressing that he is trying to live that way. In other words, trying to live righteously. Jesus said salvation has come to this house now. And the reason is because he is a child of Abraham. But the reason he even says that is because they're grumbling about him being a sinner. They literally, the crowd, the multitudes, the crowd that followed Jesus, literally thought he abrogated his lineage of Abraham by his having become a tax collector. In other words, you're no longer a people of my people. You're no longer a son of Abraham. You're no longer a brother of me and others who are children of Abraham. You have become something worse than the dogs. Uh, do you remember the uh, Samaritans uh, when they came back from the Babylonian captivity? And how that they were people that had intermarried with the local peoples so that the Jews that had been left when they took the Babylonian exile had become an impure race. And there's a strong movement then when they come back to make sure they separate out from them. By the time of Jesus, the Samaritans were considered worse than even the Romans. They were impure Jews is essentially what it boiled down to. And that's kind of the way they thought of Zacchaeus as a publican, an impure Jew. He was one who was tainted and as a result could not be righteous before God simply because of a blood issue of lineage. And yet Jesus uses that blood issue of lineage to point out, ah, but he is a child of Abraham. Salvation came to the Jews first, didn't it? And then it went to the Gentiles, went to the rest of the world. But it came to the Jews first, and Zacchaeus was one of those. All right, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It seems like a simple statement. In Matthew, where the passage is, is actually uh, given, Matthew chapter 10, I believe it is, um, there's a question mark because some of the early manuscripts don't show it. Some of the other uh, translations of early times don't show it. They say, well, it must have been added in. Well, if it was added in in Matthew 10, it wasn't here. Here there is no question of it being a part of the text, a part of what Jesus said. And we can take it with confidence of knowing that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. So if I ask you a question right now, you're uh, going to heaven on the basis of the answer to this question. So make sure you say it correctly. Why did Jesus come to seek and to save the lost? It wasn't to heal the sick. It wasn't to give hope, it wasn't to give comfort. It was all those things that happened as a result of what he came to do, but that's not why he came. He came to seek and to save the lost. In the seeking and saving of the lost, that sometimes meant he went to have dinner at a sinner's home, didn't he? Or maybe he redefined it a little bit, or maybe they had ref refined the definition. They're the ones who called it a sinner's home. He didn't, because whom home would he go to if there was no, if it was a, uh, had to be a non-sinner that he went to eat with. Uh, any of you guys going to take him to lunch today because you're not a sinner? Just thought I'd ask. Yeah, it didn't make any sense. It's one of those nonsensical thinkings, nonsensical statements. If he's a sinner, then he's ideal for what Jesus came to do. He's ideal to go home with. We, on the other hand, we're righteous, so Jesus wouldn't come with us, right? Right? No, actually, that's not quite the way it works, is it? But rather, we are all sinners. And as a result, our home would be just as appropriate as Zacchaeus's for Jesus to come have dinner with us because we need salvation also. Now, some of us in here say, yeah, but I already have salvation. Yeah, but why do you have it? Uh, because I'm so good. No, no, that's not quite right. Uh, because I'm so righteous. No, that's not quite right either, is it? Uh, because I haven't done anything that bad. Oh, yeah, well, maybe there's a good argument. Try that one, okay? Go ahead, try that one, I dare you. The idea that we're not so bad is an argument we make to ourselves. Remember the passage where he says that uh, there were those who justified themselves by themselves? In other words, as long as I'm comparing myself to myself, I'm not that bad. I can find a way to make myself feel good about myself, or at least not bad about myself, if I work at it hard enough. 
And by the way, you know that most people, when they do surveys, when you ask someone who's a, a worse, how, you know, who's the worst sinners? Well, it's somebody who sins more than I do. Now, they never put that question in that form on the survey, but that's basically what it boils down to. Now, the psychologists say that's a healthy way of looking at things because if we didn't, we'd all just basically dissolve into a bowl full of jelly and never be able to function in this world. Okay? That's great for a psychologist, but it doesn't work theologically, does it? People that are worse sinners than others, yes, there are. But let me ask you this. Was Adolf Hitler's sins worse than my sins? Oh, they had to be. They're horrible. Seven million Jews alone in World War II massacred. Yeah, yeah, I know. Sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? How about Pol Pot? You guys remember Pol Pot? Well, some of you are old enough. Most of us in here are old enough. Yeah, horrible. They call them the killing fields in Cambodia. Literally, a field with skulls on it where you could walk without touching the ground because there had been so many people killed and buried there or partially buried there. Oh, let's see, Stalin, we're still finding out how many he killed, and we quite haven't quite counted it up yet, have we? Oh, yeah, those are the worst sinners of all time. Oh, really? Is that the way God counts it? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Let's look at a couple of quick scriptures. Matthew 1, verse 21. The angel comes to Mary. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For it is he who shall save his people from their sins. Jesus will save his people from their sins. Well, if they're his people, they're not sinful, are they? Apparently so. Luke 15, verse 32. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. That obviously is from the prodigal son story. And the idea that God had a people who were lost is really the whole point. He came to seek and to save what was lost. Adam and Eve story, if nothing else. Adam and Eve were put in the garden. Were they sinners when they got into the garden? No theologian ever made that argument. Well, okay, maybe someone did, but I don't know them. But the point of it was, once they were in the garden, they had the choice of good and evil, and they chose poorly, didn't they? To quote a movie, he chose poorly. No, they didn't just chose poorly. They rebelled against God. And God saw it that way. And it wasn't a pleasant thing. So it had to become an issue of salvation. John chapter 12, verse 47. If anyone hears my saying and does not keep them, I don't judge him, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. You listen to a lot of preachers in the churches over the years, and you kind of get the impression that Jesus came to judge the world, didn't he? Not to save it, but to condemn it. I remember reading uh, one of those, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He goes through some pretty horrible stuff. Well, he's a product of his time, product of the theology of his time and everything else. But that wouldn't have been a plug nickel that would have been worth any less than the people in his audience because he was preaching to his own membership about how horrible they were before God. Well, yeah, that's true, I guess, isn't it? But he came to seek and to save the lost, didn't he? And that's really what it's all about. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Seeing that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God, it was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Why did Jesus come? To save us. Save everybody. Save those who believe. Now, I'm, I, I'm a universalist personally. You know what that is? Somebody who thinks everybody's going to be saved? Okay, well, maybe that's not exactly the way I am. What I say is, if they will believe, everybody can be saved. I asked this question once, what if Adolf Hitler repented? Oh, no, 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 he had done too much. What would be too much? <coughs> well, obviously what Adolf Hitler did, right? Now, he was an evil man, don't get me wrong. But even evil people can repent, can't they? Now, repentance is not something that we just casually do. Repentance is something that is deeply ingrained within us as a response of godly sorrow to the call of our God. And then we would show fruit worthy of repentance, wouldn't we? But Jesus came for whom? His soul too. He came to seek and to save some of who were lost. 
uh, the Americans who were lost. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Who's those? Sounds to me like everybody. And if it's everybody, that would include the worst sinners we possibly have ever known, including the people sitting next to you in the pew. Okay? Whomever, whosoever will. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. Talk about the worst sinners. We can add another name to that list, at least by his own description. That's the Apostle Paul. So 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. Faithful is the saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I'm number one. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've cried number one before a time or two. Usually I don't mean it. And usually it's something trivial like a football team or a school or something like that. And that's trivial. Jesus didn't come for trivial things, though, did he? He came for souls. Paul, when he says, I am chief, he has a reason to say that. He talks about the persecution of the church. He talks about putting Christians in prison. He's talking about how that he took their lives and their possessions and he did it because he thought it was the right thing to do. Now, he does say that perhaps that's one of the reasons he found mercy in God's sight. But the fact is, he was opposing God. How many are worse than that? Well, we all are just as bad as that, really. Young preacher, Timothy, the Apostle Paul talks to him and he says, Take heed to thyself and to thy teaching. Chapter 4, verse 16. Continue in these things, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those that hear you. Preachers have a grave responsibility, don't we? All of us in here are preachers in some form or fashion. And we all have a grave responsibility. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. If we're servants of Jesus, we are also doing what? Seeking and saving those who are lost. That may take some of you places that I wouldn't be happy going myself, but you'll be able to go there and do it. There'll be places that I'll go that you wouldn't be comfortable going to that I will be able to go to that you can't, but I'll preach the gospel while I'm there. I'll live the gospel while I'm there. But Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, and that's what we're here for. Let's put it into perspective for a moment. James chapter 5, verse 20, to close it out with. He who converts a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. That's really what it's about, isn't it? When someone's converted, we save a soul from death. And apparently in the process, we cover a multitude of sins. I'm not sure what that means, to be honest with you. I'm not sure he's just expressing the idea that an individual could have sinned a whole lot more if he'd have stayed lost. I don't think that's what it is, though. But the idea that God will forgive sinners. God will save sinners. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did my Savior come to earth? Because he loved me, yes, but why did he come? Not what prompted him to come, but what caused him to actually give up heaven to come here. He says, I came to seek and to save the lost. There's one ultimate goal Jesus came for. Nothing trivial like healing the sick. Nothing trivial or secondary like hope, comfort. None of the things that you and I would look for as a human, but rather what God would look to as a God. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. 